All right, so uh, lesson number three today, we're starting um, uh, the pattern of witness, and we're in John chapter one. Open your Bibles, please, to John chapter one. Um, so um, we're looking at John's presentation of Jesus as, bully, uh, as fully God and man. That's why the series is called uh, the book of John, Jesus the God-Man, and that's how, uh, that's how John the, uh, the apostle presents him. And he makes uh, this presentation by using these uh, different strands of narrative. Three narrative strands. This is a little bit of review for those who may not have been here last time. So um, the first strand, if you wish, um, is made up of accounts of Jesus' ministry and His miracles. And these are there to show both His divine nature and His human nature. So you have a human being walking around, you know, like any other human being, and that human being is also doing mighty miracles. And you'll find that, that strand of thought, that strand of narrative throughout the book of John. A second strand um, contains stories of how some people react to Jesus. And so John you know, describes how did the Pharisees react to the God-man? How did the priests react to the uh, uh, God-man? Um, uh, uh, how did the general uh, population react to him? And he tells stories about uh, individuals who react to him with faith, those who believe and what happened to those people. And then the third strand is a reaction of disbelief. Uh, again, stories and accounts of individuals who heard the very same teachings, saw the very same miracles, um, but they disbelieved and what happened to those individuals. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't you know, his pattern, the way he writes his gospel, he doesn't do you know, six chapters, uh, first six chapters, Jesus the God-man. Uh, next six chapters, all the people who, you know, it's not like that. It's the three strands are interwoven into one single narrative throughout the entire, throughout the entire uh, book. So that's pretty much what we've been talking about. Uh, in the last couple of lessons, we've seen John begin with a statement that presents Jesus as the divine Messiah, how some would believe, others would disbelieve, and that section is in um, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. It's called the prologue. So his first introduction to, of Jesus to the people called the prologue. Uh, first 18 verses, he summarizes his entire gospel and he also demonstrates these three strands uh, that he will use throughout the, um, throughout the entire book. So after the prologue, we looked at the first character introduced by the gospel writer and the first character introduced is John the Baptist. Of course, the first one is Jesus himself, but then the next one is John the Baptist. Now, as far as the gospel is concerned, John the Baptist is the first example of someone who, who believed. So you see, he introduces Jesus, the God-man in the prologue, then he introduces John the Baptist. He's the first individual uh, that uh, believed. Now in the last lesson we, uh, we had, uh, we examined um, uh, John's witness of faith and his role in preparing the way for the Messiah. Today I'd like to finish up this chapter and show you within these verses the basic pattern that was established for soul winning. So we're going to kind of do a little digression here if you wish. We're going to leave our main framework of study and our main framework of study throughout the book of John is examining these three strands okay, of narratives. We're going to take a break from that and we're going to look at a kind of open a sub file here. Uh, John chapter 1, 35 to 51, where John talks about uh, the power of witnessing. Uh, we'll notice an early pattern of evangelism that begins with John and uh, seeing him speak out to bring in the first six close disciples of Jesus. I, you know, we know this, I don't have to tell you this, I mean, there was no Bible school in those days, no uh, worship services, correspondence courses, home Bible. I mean, that, those things didn't exist then. So how did they convert people into becoming disciples of Jesus? You know, how did they do that? Well, they did it through personal witness. And a lot of times we don't like to use that term in the church because it, you know, it brings up other type of things that we might not uh, 
agree with, not, not part of our, of our religious vocabulary, my personal witness. We usually hear that from our friends in the evangelical world, you know, but we don't usually use that term. And yet, it's a very biblical term. As a matter of fact, it's the first form of evangelism, and it's very, very uh, effective. So before we start to describe the pattern, let's examine what the word witness means, because it was a word to describe what John the Baptist was doing. So a witness is a, um, uh, is a person who declares as true what he has seen, what he has heard, or what he knows. Um, the Greek word for witness uh, is martus or martyr, from which comes the word martyr in English, T-Y-R, martyr. And martyr describes a person who witnesses the truth of something with their death. So, you know, the generic word martyr just means a, a witness. But today we, we use the term martyr not for any type of witness, but for a witness that includes a person's, a person's life. And so the apostles were chosen to be witnesses of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter one, verse eight. Now I explain all of this because it's through a witness that the first six disciples came to Jesus. That's how they came to Him. All right? And John explains the pattern and the power of witnessing in the first chapter, verses 35 to 51. So that's why I say we're going to open a subfile here. We're going to take a look at the pattern of witnessing that was taking place um, uh, in John's gospel. Now when we read uh, John chapter one, verses one to 18, what we're reading in summary form is John the Apostle's witness concerning Jesus. Whereas most of the other writers give their witness further into their, you know, into their record, into their gospel, John begins with his witness. That's why his is so unusual. In verses 19 to 34, we looked at John the Baptist and what we saw was John the Baptist's witness concerning Jesus. So how did John make disciples? Well, he witnessed. He told them what he had heard and what he had seen. So in verses 35 to 51, we're going to see how the pattern of witnessing works to produce disciples and new witnesses who in turn bring other disciples. Again, the biblical pattern for evangelism. So let's go to John chapter 1, verse 35, and let's read that first, shall we? It says, again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So this brief description is about John and two converts that he makes. The question is, how do witnesses become witnesses? The answer is, they hear a witness about someone or something from another person. For example, John became a witness because of what God witnessed to him concerning the coming Messiah, which John confirmed by looking in the scriptures. John believed the witness and in turn began to witness what had, what had been revealed to him. So Jesus' first two disciples heard John's witness they believed it and consequently they began to follow Jesus. Not John, but Jesus. So let's keep reading 38 and 39. It says, and Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you going? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. So what do you think happened that day when they went with Jesus? Do you think they went and took a nap or played video games, you know, or? No. You know, the Bible is very compact in its descriptions. 
there were questions, there were discussions about who Jesus was. What did John mean? Don't you think they, don't you think they asked Jesus, what, what did John mean when he referred to you as the Lamb of God? What is he talking about? Well, I'd love to have been in that discussion, you know, to, to hear what was going on. But we see by their following actions that they had uh, to make a decision about him, and they did. All right, so let's keep going. Verse 40, he says, um, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. Don't you think that that's what they were talking about with Jesus? Who are you? What, what does he mean? He brought him to Jesus and Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which uh, translated uh, is Peter. So what does Andrew do the next day? He himself becomes what? He becomes a witness. So in these brief verses we see kind of a pattern or a cycle that begins to, uh, begins to develop. First of all, God witnesses to John about the Messiah and his role in preparing the way for the Messiah. And he does this through signs and his word. Next, John makes his witness about Jesus to the people. Next, two people believe John's witness, they follow Christ. And then what happens to them? Well, they themselves become witnesses for Christ and bring two others. Now, that was the elementary form of evangelism at the beginning. Uh, a lot of times we have, you know, we, we, we have huge uh, programs and so on and so forth, you know, but in the end, what are we doing? Well, we're trying to witness to other people. So we see them, we see then rather that the witness for Jehovah is Christ. The witness for Christ was John and from John's witness came others who were ready to witness for Christ as well and still bring others. And that chain, if you wish, continues to this, to this day. Uh, I, for example, uh, I witness, well, one of the main ways is through my website, our website. That's my witness. Uh, not everybody has that opportunity. You know, uh, I've often said, you know, if, if, if Hal hadn't married my daughter, my witness would be a lot different. <laughs> but uh, you know, we, we've, we've merged the two expertise and this comes out, so we get to witness. When we, when we say uh, uh, 3,000 or 5,000 people visited the website or went on YouTube or whatever to look at videos and download stuff, what we're saying is, we witnessed to 5,000 people this week. Now that's not, a, that's not a lot compared to what other people on the internet are getting. You know, like I've often said, a guy sets his cat on fire, a million people will see that. You know? But, but, but that, that, that has the power to make you laugh or say, wow, look at that, it's all, man, you got to go, go see this here, here's a link, go check that out. Well, that's not what we're looking for. You know? What we're looking for is the opportunity to witness to somebody else about Christ. Okay, but, but everybody else has a different way of witnessing. You have a, a way of sharing your faith at work or inviting a friend to church. That's, that's, a, that's a witness. Everybody finds their way, let's put it that way. All right, let's keep going, 43 to 46. He says, the next day he purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, well, come and see. You see the pattern? Very same cycle. The crowds that followed Jesus that waited for him to teach, how did they know where to go to hear him? Well, these guys. They were going ahead, make a witness. He's coming, he's going to be here. Well, what, do we, what do we call that today? What do we call it? Advertising, you know, the sign out front or Marty's article, for example, in the local paper each week, you know, to giving a little taste of the teaching that goes on here in the congregation, inviting people to come and see, come and hear. 
So the disciples were the ones who provided the crowds. And how did they do that? Well, through their witnessing. Verse 47 to 49. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you when you were under a fig tree, or the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. So in these verses, John gives more details concerning Jesus' witness and the disciples' reaction. First of all, um, Jesus convinced them or witnessed to them concerning His true identity with His teaching. I'm sorry, I didn't read this particular uh, verse here. Uh, I'll read it in a minute. Uh, his claims were backed up by His power. He was a, his was a power-based witness. You know, uh, going back to Hal and I's project, ours is a media-based witness. Uh, sometimes we have a service-based witness. Somebody's sick, you bring them food, you go bring them to church. That's a service-based witness or a teaching-based witness or a whatever. There's a different, different. But Jesus' witness was power-based. You know, he said to them, well, if you don't believe me, at least believe what? Yeah, the things that I do. You know, I mean, okay, you, you don't believe what I'm saying to you? What, what do the miracles that I'm doing tell you about me? So his was a power-based witness. Now the decision, regardless of who it was, was always the same decision. Is he or is he not the Son of God? Is he or is it for the Jews, is he or is he not the Messiah? Even to this day, doesn't it eventually come down to that? You witness, you serve, you, whatever, you invite, but somewhere along the line, at some point, you're going to ask that person the question, well, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And they say, well, yeah, you know, I mean, according to all that you've shown me or taught me, yes, yes. And then, of course, you know, what do I do now? Well, repent, be baptized. You know, but the witness always leads to the same place. And my pet peeve sometimes is we lose focus. We think the witness should lead to some particular doctrine or other. That the Church of Christ is the true church. Well, we hope we are. We hope we're a New Testament church, but that's not what our witness is leading us to. Or you know, we, ought to just, we ought to not use instruments in worship. Well, that's true, that's biblical, but that's not the object of our witness. The object of our witness is to get that person to the point where they'll make that decision about who the Christ is. The other things, obviously, we're going to teach, how the church should be organized, and how, how should we worship, and so on and so forth. But let's not make that the uh, uh, let's not make that the object of our, work, uh, of our, of our witness. So Nathanael you know, is very clear in his confession of faith. When we keep going, verse 15, he says, boy, you're the son of God. And Jesus just said that he saw him before. He hadn't even done any miracles yet. So Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Well, there's a couple of explanations we need here. Truly, truly, or verily, verily, means actually amen and amen. In other words, what I'm about to say is very important. You've been in Bible classes before where the teacher has said this. When you see Jesus say, truly, truly, or verily, verily, pay attention. So Nathanael has just experienced the supernatural knowledge of Jesus, but in the future he will actually see with his eyes Jesus' supernatural works. The idea of the angels ascending and descending is a way of saying to Nathanael, you will see into the supernatural, into the divine power that I, that I possess. All right. The reference to the heavens opening up and angels ascending and descending means that while Jesus was on the earth, all of the heavens' power was at His disposal. And He's saying to Nathaniel, you'll be a witness of that power. You think this is good, that I knew that you were under the, you, know, you think you're impressed with that? In today's vernacular, it's almost like saying, you ain't seen nothing. 
You, you've not seen a thing. Wait, you're going to see a lot more than that if you become my, my disciples. Now the reference to the Son of Man comes from Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 and this is a unique term applied to Jesus. Now it's always the Son of Man and not a Son of Man. All right? He's not just one of the sons of men. There are Bible translations that try to get that article out of there, but in the original language the article is there. The Son of Man, meaning it's unique. It's a generic term casting Jesus as the Son of Mankind. And it suggests that Jesus is a man who possesses a human nature in a way that no man has ever possessed it. So the term refers to His uniqueness. Of course, we know that Jesus' unique status is that He is what? We've, we've coined the term for this whole series. What do we call Him? Jesus, He's the God-man. So we know that Jesus' unique status is that He's the only man possessing both a human nature and a divine nature simultaneously. But for Him to actually say that and explain that to them this early on, they wouldn't get it. It, it, it would overwhelm them. It was too much. So He uses this term, son of man, taken out of Daniel to refer to to himself. And so Jesus' words, you know, they finish off this section by stating that His witness will only grow stronger for those who believe in Him. He said to Nathanael, come and follow me. And Nathanael said, you're the Son of God. And Jesus said, you haven't seen anything yet. Good for you. you know, you're going to follow? Watch. And sometimes I think you almost wish you could say that to someone that you're teaching or sharing your faith with. And you say, oh, if you only knew the joy, if you only knew the gifts that belong to those who follow Jesus, if I could just take something, give you a taste of it, you know, you'd be there right away. But they have, to, they have to come through faith. So as we close out our lesson, I'd like to make a few comments about the witnessing and its importance in our Christian lives. First of all, each of us owes our salvation to somebody else's witness. Doesn't matter who you are. Some people say, well, I grew up in the church. Well, whose witness did you get then? You know, well, probably your mom <laughs> who drug you out of bed and dressed you up and got you to church on time. I've always said to moms who have you know, two, three, four children, five children, uh, there's a special place in heaven for you <laughs> because for at least 10 years, you haven't heard a sermon, you haven't been able to get communion in peace and quiet. You've had to bring kids to church and make sure they're okay and drag them out of one class and train them to sit quietly during the assembly. And you yourself have probably not worshiped a whole lot for 10 years. So whether it was through your mom or VBS or a book or an invitation to worship, a newspaper article. That was the case for me. It was a newspaper article that kind of grabbed my attention. I've told you this before. A newspaper article that said, sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ. Boy, that spoke to me. Sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ. And when I, I said, there's got to be something going on at that church. Because none of the other churches in the newspaper that, were, that had ads said anything. All they said was, well, bingo on Friday night or clothing drive and you know, whatever. Not bad things. You know, they weren't doing bad things. They were saying, uh, we're a friendly church. You know, uh, or come hear our preacher. You know, exciting. We're, we're, having, a, we're having a play. You know, we're having a, an Easter play or something. You know? And then I saw this little article that said, sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ. And I said, well, he's talking to me. He's talking to me, that guy. And what's interesting about that article is that it was the only time that they put it in the newspaper and I was the only one that answered the ad. No one else ever came. I was the only person that came to that ad. You know? And the guy who put it in, you know, he, he, thought, he, he saw himself as a failure, as a missionary. 
because I was one of the only people he ever baptized. He was there for five years. So you know, you never know how God is going to use the, the, little that you, the little that you offer them. The idea, of course, is that not every witness is done in the same way. Not everybody has the same talent, but all need to witness in some manner. That's why I said, you know, our witness is this, this project here. Your witness may be, may be different. Either you witness directly for Christ through a direct one-on-one -on -one contact, or you do it indirectly by participating in a lot of the works of the church. Why, why do we have works? You know, we're asking people to volunteer for this or that. Why? Well, because we're trying to give people an opportunity to witness. Witness to children, witness to neighbors, witness to the elderly, witness to newcomers, somehow. Witness, you know, visitation programs, a chance to witness to uh, people who visit the church or people who haven't been coming for a while. So the bottom line is that we are each responsible to continue the cycle of witness which first brought the original disciples to Christ and then eventually brought us to Christ. Same chain. There are a lot of methods but we all have to make a witness for Christ. Number two, the subject of our witness is Jesus Christ. Our basic witness is not that the Church of Christ is the true church, as I said, or we're the purest doctrinally of all the religious groups. Our witness is not even that the Bible is inspired. It is, we believe that, but that's not our witness. Our witness is that Jesus is the divine Son of God and the Savior of souls. Our witness is that Jesus is the Lord of our lives and the Savior of our souls. Maybe the point I'm trying to make here is that your witness is about yourself. How has God worked in your life and how is He working in your life? I played golf uh, yesterday, it was a nice day in the afternoon and uh, it was a little slow on the course and so there was another guy behind me, he was playing by himself, I'm playing by myself and uh, uh, I said, well, you want to play together, finish out the last four holes? Sure, you know, that's what you do when you play golf. Hi, you know, he said, my name is so-and-so, and I said, hey, I'm Mike, you know, okay, and we start playing, and he was hitting a shot and going, ah, man, blast that flatter apps, you know, rah, you know, so on and so forth, and, and then a couple of holes in, you know, the inevitable questions, so what do you do? I said, I'm a preacher, and he looked at me and goes, no way. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here, you know. <laughs> And of course, our, 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 we only play for you know, maybe a half hour together. Usually when you're on the golf course, you're talking about golf you know, and so on and so forth. But I noticed that just the fact that he knew that I was a, a preacher, therefore a Christian, modified a certain, his behavior to a certain degree because he had expectations of me. He didn't know me, but he had expectations of me. And so that's, that's what witness is about. People have expectations of you as a Christian and it's terrible when we don't follow through on them. So there are a lot of methods, but we all have to make a witness for Christ. And the subject is Christ. The purpose of our witness is to bring people face to face with this reality. And you know, in that very small way, that individual was brought face to face with the fact that he had to make a decision because he talked about, he was a very knowledgeable guy. He had studied a lot and he knew a lot about philosophy and theology and so on and so forth, but I could tell he was still you know, grappling with it. So you know, the best I could do is give him my card. Okay, and he, he, he said he'd been online a lot looking at theology and so on and so forth. I said, well, go to BibleTalk.tv and go, go check it out. You know? so, I mean, I, the best I could do at the moment. And he hooked up with some of his friends as I was leaving. They said, come on, we'll go play another nine holes. You know, so he left, but at least I gave him my card. That was my little witness. Now, <clears throat> our witness may not be like Jesus' witness because we don't have that lifestyle and so on and so forth. And sometimes the negative response that we receive may be an obstacle to us but we need to remember that Jesus said that if we don't witness Him on earth, He's not going to witness for us in heaven, Matthew 10, verse 32. So we need to make the witness. Remember, we're not responsible for how the guy, the other person responds. We're responsible for making the witness. 
I know you've heard that a lot, but I know so many Christians who feel guilty or who feel I'm no good or I'm not good enough and so on and so forth because I haven't, I've never baptized anybody or whatever. We need to remember that our responsibility is to make the witness, not to make them. You can't arm wrestle anybody into the water. You can't do it. I mean, in my family, no one, I mean, I, I've been a preacher you know, 33 years and then was a Christian before that, obviously. And in my family, not a single person. I had a Bible study with one person managed in my own family, but even to this day, won't even go on the website to, 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 to check stuff out, so you know. But they've heard, they've gotten the witness, they know. All right, number three, our lifestyle confirms our witness. Jesus said, let your light or your witness shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So if our lifestyles have no moral power, then our witness will have no saving power. In the Bible, the witnesses were prepared and often forfeited their very lives as a confirmation that what they said was true. I mean, in the Old Testament, the prophets, the Lord Himself, the apostles, Christian martyrs. You know, when we say Christian martyrs, we, sh we could say Christian witnesses throughout history have given up a lot. All of them were willing to lay down their lives so that others would be assured that their witness was sincere and true and powerful. You know, people do not give up their lives for a lie or a mistake. And people are never inspired by lukewarm witness. They're inspired by something that is hot, that is sincere, that is true. Now, I know most, if not all of us, have received the witness of Christ's pardon and power in some way, and I'm persuaded that most have decided to believe the witness and become disciples of Jesus, in this room, certainly. True maturity, however, comes when we complete the cycle and we begin making our witness to somebody else for Christ. You see what I'm saying? The, the complete cycle of our Christian maturity, you know you're hitting your stride mature-wise when you're not the one always receiving the witness from teachers and preachers and books you read and so on and so forth, but you become the one who is making the witness to others. Now, that turnaround happens very quickly in the in the Gospels, you know, in the same chapter, uh, you know, John points to somebody and then two lines lower they follow Jesus and two lines lower, they, there may have been some time lapse there. That's a kind of a compressed thing. But um, uh, that cycle is part of our own Christian uh, development. A lot of times people you know, fail to witness in, in various ways. You know, we're not witnessing directly or indirectly to anyone. You know, we just neglect to do it. I, I, I'm, I'm the worst for that. In the sense that I, if I'm on the plane, for example, the last thing I want to do is talk to the person next to me. I don't know about you, but I just want to get into my book. Turning sideways for two and a half hours gives me a headache. <laughs> my daughter's laughing, yeah, sure. So sometimes we have an opportunity and just we neglect to do so. And sometimes it's not just a stranger, sometimes it's people we know, people in our families. And we just neglect to, to make a witness for Christ. And sometimes we eliminate the power of the gospel in our own witness because we have low moral standards or we lack you know, commitment to the church. The saddest thing, a visitor comes and says, uh, comes to Bible class Sunday morning and says, oh, uh, John invited me. And you know that John usually never comes to Bible school. He comes to worship in the morning, that's it. And the, the one they witnessed to and invited to Bible class is in the class, but John is not there. Not because he's sick, because you know he never comes to Bible class. That's a, that's a sad thing. And more times than not, that visitor will not come, you know, because they say, well, if he doesn't come, why should I? The, the, the fun thing about the mission work in Montreal, especially when the church was first you know, established there, there were the same number of people who came to Bible study as 
to worship because they didn't know any better. <laughs> they figured, oh, it's all worship. <laughs> you know, normal worship is you have a Bible class and then you have a worship service with a sermon. That's what's normal. You know, the, at the beginning, nobody thought of, I could cut out half of that and just come to the other half. You know? it was, and we didn't tell them. <laughs> so people may not like it or accept it, but people actually expect Christians to witness to them. They may not like it, but they expect it. They expect that of us. And our witness falls short when we don't deliver on people's expectations of us in spiritual matters. So we've digressed a little bit this morning in order to examine the evangelistic pattern outlined for us in these few verses. Very simple, you hear the witness, Romans 10, 17, right? Faith comes by hearing. We believe the witness, those who believe and are baptized will be saved, Mark 16, 15 and 16. And then we witness to others, Jesus says, teaching them all things that I've commanded you. It's a very, very uh, simple pattern, but uh, sometimes we, we kind of neglect it. All right, so next week we're going to go back to our main outline, review the first burst of ministry that Jesus accomplishes as He begins to preach in the northern part of the country. All right, I thank you for your attention.